Hi, it's Mary Beth Decker with sacredgrove.com, where people and pets heal and connect. And I am really lucky to have Pete here today. Pete Johnson, uh, what can I say? Well, let me read his bio and you can see why I feel like I'm lucky to have Pete here today. Oh. So here we go. With an esteemed career as a chief operations officer, multiple patent holder and co-founder of a 30 plus year best in class international business, Peter understands the importance of knowledge, its value in the marketplace, the healing it can bring to the suffering and the ethics it requires. I love that. As a native of Virginia Beach, Virginia, Peter grew up and still lives in the light and influence of the Edgar Casey Foundation. With a university education and business success long achieved, Peter then felt and followed the divine nudge to combine his unique psychic skill set with his practical business acumen. Peter's primary audience is best classified as business to business. Now hang in with me because we don't usually talk about business to business, but you're going to love what we're talking about here. Government and law enforcement agencies, insurance companies, human resources departments, human resource departments, law firms, and healthcare providers, among others. His services include intuitive personnel, partnership, and executive assessment, management, and selection, psychic location and evidence recovery, and strategic foresight prediction and analysis of energetic trends for opportunity exploration and maximization. However, today we focus on a subset of Peter's skills, namely telepathic communication at the end of life, or what Peter more easily terms mediumship for the living. Peter works on a contractual or consultant type basis with skilled nursing, memory care, home health, autism, and other private service providers to deliver unique communication services for the family members, friends, or caretakers of those approaching the end of life, or others who are permanently or temporarily unable to communicate for themselves. This includes the unconscious, persons on the spectrum, stroke victims, dementia patients, infants, and more. Be it misunderstood or troubling behaviors, final wishes, or proactively clearing any lingering question or issue before transition. Telepathic communication can be instrumental in reframing complex relationships or familial issues to enable a compassionate and healing space, not only for the person themselves, but for all, also for the caretakers or family members that remain. Oh, and I really love this, Pete. Welcome, thank you for coming today. Thank you, that, that's a mouthful, I know. <laughs> you know, it, it was, and I thought, no, but I need to say all of this. There's something magical in all those words, and I'm hoping everybody's here is, is, are feeling those, they're that that energy that you have around what you do. Um, and here's the thing, I love the fact that you you focus for humans, what I do, do and you can do, because you do animal communication, for animals who are transitioning. And um, there is so much, there's so much peace that can be gathered and shared when people choose to check out a telepathic communication with their family member, whether it's a human family member or somebody of, of another species. Um, so I'm gonna stop for a second and say, tell, tell us more, Pete, tell us a little bit more before I ask questions. Well, the, you know, my, um, you know, I have a general focus of the other work that I do, which I find quite rewarding, particularly that with the law enforcement another but admittedly I the, the work that I find the most um, gratifying and fulfilling is this 
um, uh, the telepathic work, particularly for those that are at the end of life. Um, as she, you know, I both know we can, you know, you can communicate um, telepathically with, with all life, um, you know, from pets and people and, you know, uh, many people say plants and all the other stuff. You can do all of that. Um, however, um, you know, I do know that, uh, you know, there's in watching, you'll see so many shows nowadays that are mediumship based. Um, and I always thought, well, you know, it, it feels like it's so after the fact when you're trying to help somebody move through grief or to um, help them resolve something when the person is no longer here. Um, and it was actually my father-in-law when he began to develop dementia. You know, I had my medium mystic skills. They already existed. Um, and I used them to a certain extent. But I realized that my father-in-law, who was still with us and still is, was beginning to communicate with me. And that's when I was like, okay, um, it was a bit of a, a twist for me, but I liked it um, <laughs> because he was still able to communicate, but there were things going on that as he um, found himself deeper and deeper in dementia, he couldn't voice. And for anybody that knows of uh, the, you know, the heartbreaking necessity of caring for somebody um, in this and moving towards the end of life, um, you know, having practical solutions and answers and understanding, particularly of what's really going on with people, um, uh, it, it doesn't make it any easier on your heart, but it can make it much easier consciously as you deal with this over a protracted period of time. So this is where I kind of, I, I consider it, um, although I'm desperately sad to really have kind of, you know, lost the companionship and golf buddy that my father-in-law was, um, his, uh, you know, let's put it willingness to kind of step in and realize he could, on some level, his higher self realized he could communicate with me. Um, that's what began this journey. And that's when I realized, well, okay, I can communicate with him. What about um, somebody else who can't communicate, like an autistic kid or something like that? Um, and that's where this kind of whole area that I termed mediumship for the, for the living developed. That term just makes the telepathic communication part of this more accessible, I think, to public understanding or quick public yeah. understanding. But, you know, I, working with kids on the spectrum or whatever it may be, I just know that um, particularly as those that we know are caretakers and those that are really challenged in dealing with those at the end of life, um, there's a lot that we really wish we could understand. Um, families and relationships are not easy, even in the best of times. And having um, sometimes what are, it is a practical understanding of what really is desired, what needs to be solved, what a final wish is, whether it's just validating or confirming, or whether it's something, it's newer novel information, I, I discovered that it was incredibly healing for the family members, but then also in the telepathic exchange, um, and you know, there's a couple of stories that we can talk about later, but in that telepathic exchange, even though they can't say it verbally, their relief in knowing that what they needed to know was communicated or what they want to happen has been communicated, it just releases them and changes the entire energetics of the situation a lot of times at the end. And that's what I found so incredibly rewarding. And the fact that um, dying is a process and coming to the end is a process. And um, you know, Barbara Carnes and many others calls it the labor of leaving. And uh, you know, there's a what we have to go through, and I've since through the zillions of people I've talked to now realized that we can actually do some things to make that process easier, not only for those that are passing, but for the family members and the caretakers that are so caught up in it in a daily basis. So yeah. that's where I just said, I kind of, I focus on, on that side of it. Um, Cause I feel like it's so it's practical. It helps resolve the issues. And secondly, when they do pass, Everybody's at peace. 
there is, you know, there's no, um, there's no lingering issues. If I, if I would, I should, I, did I, um, because the, the, the inter intervention of the telepathic communication allows you to solve all of that. So when they do leave, you can celebrate it. You can be in it. It doesn't make it any easier, but it resolves so many of those things that linger afterwards that people quite often go to a medium for. So yeah. I turned it around thinking that, you know, thanking my father-in-law for what he did, but also realizing that, you know, it, it, it clears the path. People move forward a lot quicker. Um, and I think, you know, that's what you've also discovered with our, you know, your animals and how communicating for them and how that enables people to, as heartbreaking as it is, find a way to let the animal go and for them to move forward. So, yeah, thank you. That that's really hopeful. Yeah. I, I had the same things with animals as with people, um, that you're talking about did, uh, and they have people who, those of us with animals, we, in addition to everything else, many of us have to make a decision to um, end their lives. Let's put it mm -hmm. frankly, to end their lives. And that's an additional burden that one lives with because yeah. it's a beloved uh, family member for most of us these days. And what you're talking about, um, did I do it too soon? Did I not do enough? What did I li listen to? Um, there's so much difference. I, I'll tell a quick story, but I want to. I want to hear some of yours. Uh, there was a dog uh, I met in person. Lots of neurological issues. He just walked in circles, very skinny, and they're saying, "Why is he holding on?" And I'm like, "He's waiting for a party." <laughs> and so. I, I look and I said, I got to say what I hear here. And it's the boyfriend, the girlfriend, the boyfriend looks at her and she says, he always gets a birthday party. And she says, oh yeah, we bring all the doggy cousins come over and we have doggy, uh, you know, the doggy version of birthday cake and hats. And I said, yeah, he's waiting for the party. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> uh, I didn't know, but uh, you, you just don't, you just don't know. And then the loss is easier because you found out. Well, and if you can, you can understand that the kind of the, it's not so much the frustration, but the wish or desire on behalf of that animal to, to help them understand that, God, I'd really like this one last thing. And right. you're just, you're being able to communicate that. You can imagine the relief that that animal has. Okay, I've completed my work. I can go now. Um, and this is where I think that which is so incredible because quite often missing that information, we, you know, we don't know what they could be hanging on for. And that's, that's what I love about this. It frees them and it frees us. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got some cool questions I want to ask. And we're going to uh, talk, talk a little bit and then I want to hear a story, but um, yeah. So from your work and experience, Peter, why do some people remain in the physical longer than medically expected at the end of life? I, 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 this is almost always a case of there being unresolved issues of some sort. Um, and this is why, you know, I, whether I'm talking to my human friends or anybody, I say, you know what, get your stuff figured out. Solve the issues as best you can voice what you need to voice. Don't get to the point where you can't because these things will keep you around. Because, you know, we so often wish to, you know, I wish I'd said sorry, or I wish I had contacted that person, or I wish I'd done something. Those same um, desires exist for pets and they exist for humans, um, that they wish they had that one thing figured out or done or taken care of. Um, and it's the same thing with people. And I, um, we all know that, you know, it is typically from my experience um, uh, that it is something that is unresolved that they are desperate to know before they feel they can leave. Uh, um, can you give an example of that, Pete? Is it, you know, is a, uh, without, you know, real life without names? <laughs> what? There's a, well, I've got uh, one particular story. It was an early case where um, a, uh, a woman had, uh, 
uh, it was a skilled nursing facility. I got a call from the uh, nursing staff who quite often it's either the nursing staff, the head nurse or some administrator that will call me <coughs> that is aware of my work. And uh, they had a, a woman who was brought in. She had suffered a devastating stroke, no longer able to communicate. Um, and she had been in hospice for what was a pretty protracted period of time. And um, they, you know, they couldn't, her family couldn't, and no one else could figure out, you know, what is going on? Uh, we know she would not want to live this way. Why, you know, does, do you have any insight as to why this is happening? Um, and when I, you know, I, as I tell everybody, all I can do is try. So I'm going to go in, met with her, um, sat down, and almost immediately upon my connecting with her was, Who's got Trixie? Who's got Trixie? Who's got Trixie? And, you know, of course, as you well know, kind of you have to get your bearings a little bit when you're getting some of this information or messages or symbols or whatever goes in. And, you know, I, then you start to ask questions. Who is Trixie? What is Trixie? This time, and you figure these things out. Then gradually, get, okay, it's your pet. So I didn't, um, I rarely know the situation for a person. I simply go in and I don't want to be front loaded with anything. So I typically go in, ask the information, and I went back out, talked to the senior staff and said, well, she, I believe, is wondering who has a pet of hers. Um, and I, I don't know what to tell her, but I told her that if I find out, I will come back and let her know. So, <coughs> excuse me, senior staff proceeded to contact her family. They found out where the pet was, who had it, and they said, can you go back and tell her now? So I went back, met her, communicated with her, and I said, you know what, I'm, I can only imagine how much you miss her, and I, I imagine she really misses you too. But I do want you to know that she is with a family member who lovingly took her in, she is well taken care of, she's looked after, everything. And, you know, as it takes a few seconds for that information to kind of land sometimes as we're communicating, but when it landed, she was like, oh, oh my. this enormous relief that came across her. And so much of the reason that they called me initially was her agitation, her being upset, the other stuff. From that day forward, she rested peacefully. And I think within about 10 days, she passed. All right. Because she was hanging around because... She had her stroke. She was in, separated almost immediately from her beloved pet. She had no idea what had happened to them. Um, and this is what that one little piece of information that was so incredibly important to her, um, and rightfully so, once she knew that, she could release and she rested peace so that you know they didn't have to sedate her anymore. They didn't have to do these things. She rested peacefully. And for somebody who was only expected to be in uh, rehab about four months, she had been there almost 10. So I'm not rehab, I'm sorry, hospice was there almost 10. But then you see that freed her, that information. She let out that enormous sigh, bang, peaceful. And then she could move into the labor of leaving because she was clear of anything she needed to know. And that, that's pretty much a typical example. People will remain because of issues that have not been, um, that are unresolved in many cases. That's not always the case, but in a lot of cases that I seem to be drawn into, that's what the issue is. Thank you for that. I, I guess I had my own version of that with a woman and her dog. Um, and um, it, so, I'm thinking, I don't know if she was holding on, but there was also resolution. She she had made arrangements for the dog to be taken care of by, by a, uh, an association, a nonprofit when she passed. And um, they wanted to know where the dog wanted to be. And the dog was in one of the daughter's houses, one of the daughter's house. And uh, found out that the dog loved the fact that he was with the dog the daughter <laughs> and the mom had made the decisions based on she didn't want him to be a burden to the family no. and the kids the daughter loved it because I got I got mom's dog and the dog is like 
I, I'm with mom's daughter and, and there was just so much peace that happened when they, they all agreed that Doggy can stay with uh, the daughter. Uh, it's so yeah, it's well, that was my version of it, taking it from, yeah. from the dog's point of view. Well, it is, it's and it's, that's it. It's almost always something resolved. And it's, um, I've heard of people sticking around to wondering, you know, who, who is going to get that my prized car? That was one of them. Um, oh, my goodness. So people will, you never know somebody who really loved their prized automobiles. That can be a question. Who's going to get, you know, the Cadillac? Um, so that's where I, it is something similar in a lot of cases. Um, so we try to, that's one of the things I, we, we try to step in and do is clear that out, find a resolution for it, or if there's a regret, figure out who they can talk to or not or communicate. And then once again, it releases them to do what they need to do to leave and it frees up the family members. Thank you for that. That's <clears throat> so interesting. Um, okay. Another, let's, let's talk about some other cool stuff. All of the, and I'm reading to make sure I get these questions clear. <laughs> Although unable to verbally communicate for themselves, how aware of their surroundings are lo our loved ones for the end of life or, or an unconscious state or even those with autism? What, did, what have you found in this area, Peter? They're incredibly aware. Um, and, you know, th this is why it, it's why sometimes it is so important that there are advocates that stay with people in the hospital when they can, family members, something like that, because there some people think that, well, she can't talk about me. I'm just going to ignore her all day, be it um, there's a lot of wonderful staff and then there's some not so great staff at times in these places. And it's the case where, you know, they are aware. And what's heartbreaking is sometimes when they can't communicate that they maybe wish they were treated a little bit differently or better, or they wish they had. And, you know, that's why they're aware. They still have wants or desires. I had a woman that still, she really wished her husband would, would bring blueberry smoothies to her. Oh. She just wanted that. You know, he, he adored her and he wanted to know what more he could do. She couldn't communicate it, but she was still incredibly aware. She had taste. She knew what was going on. And but she wanted those blueberry smoothies. So that was part of what I just said. Hey, you need to keep bringing those smoothies. So this little stuff like that at times, they are very aware. And that's why people will say, well, you know, I, I need you. I need you. I need you to, to do this and do this. For I was like, no, you don't. You just need to pull your chair right up next to that bed. And if you need to say or talk about or do something, they are aware. And because you know what, our, our, our mind is outside of our bodies. Our, our brain is what's stuck in the skull. We're talking with the mind, the soul. All of that is what we're communicating with. And this is where we can still have those conversations. And you know, be, be kind and loving and express all we need to express because I cannot tell you how many times I've been told by those that were either unconscious or in a state otherwise unable to communicate that said, she pulled right up next to the bed and she told me this, I want to know this now. So they are, <laughs> they're completely aware. So this is where I, I always caution people, be careful what you say. Don't assume they're not there just because they're in the last stages of dementia. Don't do this. They're, they are there. They know on very definite levels. And you and I have talked about this quite often. Those that are there, they go out and explore. Um, <clears throat> you know, their, their, their higher selves, their, um, their, their etheric bodies kind of go out and look around. They visit. Um, they do that type of stuff. So they're, they are aware when you uh, sometimes when you walk in and you feel like they're kind of they're a blank stare and not. Okay, they're really not present with me today. It's because they're not they're not grounded in their bodies. In a lot of cases, they're physically out exploring for a little while. A lot of them do that late in the afternoon. Um, it's typical what called the sundowning that you'll see with some dementia patients. But because they're out looking around, they're able to. There's nothing, and that's part of this. What you and I have talked about that disconnection exploration. What is it going to mean when I'm no longer part of this physical body? I want to go see what that's like for a little bit, and then I'm going to come back. Then I'll go. Then the next day. That's all part of this process. But as far as just 
you know, being aware, consciously talking to them, yeah, they are very aware. Um, autistic children also, they are incredibly aware, but they're often quite a lot out of their bodies, a lot. Um, they're kind of, their aura is attached to the feet and the rest of the aura is kind of flapping outside of their physical bodies. That's no why sometimes, kidding. yeah, it's part of the, um, that little bit of that disconnection that they have that um, I, when I look at them, you'll I kind of, it, it can vary from the body part, but a lot of times they're, a large portion of the aura is not in their body, quote unquote. It's kind of out and flapping around a little bit. And when I try to talk or communicate, I try to bring that in a little bit, make them more present and grounded. And then I, if I need to communicate something, I'll do it then. Um, but that's a, a part of their, that's just a part of the autism. But that's also what makes them so incredibly perceptive and special and all of those things because they're out really experiencing this 5D world like we're not able to. Um, so that's the thing which kind of makes it so special with them. And you'll get some incredible stuff back from them that they will communicate back that, because they are seeing things on an entirely different level. We are. But, but the general question, yes, they're incredibly aware. So be careful, um, you know, watch out for them, um, that type of stuff. I always tell people just always act as if they're still actively communicating with you because they are just in a different way. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that with my animals, and I, I will actually say that to people, even if their animals are not towards end of life, is they know what you're saying. I had a dog. I, I'm I'm ama I'm amazed at people that say that their animal is dumb. I mean, they mean like stupid. Yeah. And I, I had a dog once say to me, "I am not stupid." Nope. <laughs> they're listening and they're disagreeing. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. they. I suppose that's the like we believe some that the autism that that's some function of um those those harsh words and it, you're selling that it's, it's absolutely not it's it's a higher awareness um i'd like to also um with what we were talking about the fact that my dog stella was doing that that's what mm -hmm. uh, was doing that checking out and um you you put such a beautiful explanation that it's in my book piece in passing um and she finally what's interesting is she finally communicated to me that um she needed more input because she's lost sight and hearing and it was like uh, we we'd, we'd given up on her and she wasn't quite ready to be given up on so she's going with my husband farmer charlie to the neighborhood uh um little garden plots and yeah. she's still we're still taking her out and we're trying to get her to see people that she loves and and um it, she shifted back into her body more yeah. just because I could hear that and I guess what I'm I'm thinking also is that there's still time for them to make some decisions based on how we treat them and whether yeah. life is good I don't know if you've noticed that as well well, I, I think that much um, <clears throat> that's part of that kind of, you know, that that laboring of uh, during the exit. They're they're figuring things out also. Mm -hmm. uh, they're figuring out what this means. Um, in some cases, what uh, they they sometimes try to figure out what that's going to mean to us when they go. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's a bigger piece of that. And I, I think that uh, um, you know we we encourage it and. You know, I don't. I don't believe you had communicated with. Have you? I don't know if you communicated with Dewey. Did you, my dog? I don't remember I, if you did I or not. I think Dewey was already gone. We may have connected. Oh, uh, he was showing up at Val's dog bowl. That's yeah, he did. <laughs> so you know, he was he was one of those that you know he he took his sweet time, and you know this was part of my um, part of one of the things that I tell people, and it's one of my points that sometimes. And I think for animals and people, um, I had an Alzheimer's patient tell me once, um, I will exit like I lived. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? Exit as I lived, exit as I lived. All right. And it brought me back to the fact that, you know, my father in law was in life an incredibly methodical man incredibly detail-oriented. 
approached everything with excruciating precision. He was an engineer. Right? So it was one of these things where, okay, that's who he was in life. That was his personality. So guess how he's going to work through his exit in that same exact way. So this is where, you know, I, I think as we realize, okay, we our pet or our the person we love is kind of moving towards the end here. We remember who they were in life also. And, you know, I was thinking about, oh my gosh, I don't, you know, I don't want to be sitting around forever in a day like this. I wouldn't want that at all. You know, but my, my, my wife reminded me, she said, you know, you make decisions incredibly quickly. You have no regrets. You move forward. She said, you're going to be gone in an instant. You're, 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 <laughs> bang, you're just going to go. And I, you know, I said, that's probably very true because I'm just like, okay, seen it, done it, gone, bye, gone. And that's going to be me because that's my personality. That's the way that I approached everything in life. And I think as we look at our pets and the people that we love, you know, was, was this the pet that constantly smelled every blade of grass and did what they wanted to do? Was this the pet that ran through and, uh, you know, whatever. We figure out sometimes what was that personality and they will a lot of times kind of exhibit during that labor of, uh, during that labor of leaving, very much what their personality was. They want to figure it out, you know, and you, you know, our, our, our pets can be incredibly thoughtful and the way that they approach things, the way that they look at um, their lives themselves, their impact on the family. And a lot of times I think that same thing goes into it, you know, and I, I honestly do think, they think, are they going to be okay when I'm not here? Because I had a job in this house. Who's going to yeah, do my job? You know? Absolutely. Yeah, so, I see uh, that too. Yep. So that's where I think it's all part of that. And it's the same for people. You know, a, a, a person like myself who goes very quickly, bang, I'm not going to have any issue. A very methodical, very stubborn person, they're going to approach it differently also. So it's realizing that that's a part of the process. And I think mm -hmm. as I communicate with people, I try to clear out any regrets, try to figure out if there's any lingering issues, try to help them resolve anything they need to resolve. And then I let them be their personality at the end. I say, we figured all this out. We've talked to whoever you wanted. I We managed to communicate who you wanted to see. Now you do the rest, you've got it. You, you move on as you choose. And that's when they, you know, they still revert back to that personality. Well, I'm still gonna think about this a little while and I'm gonna do, okay, that's who you were. That's who you were in life. And I think our pets in many ways do the exact same thing. Yeah. That's, that's so insightful, Peter. Thank you. That is, that is really helpful to, to take a look at how they lived, whether they're human or non-human, and see that that may be the same process as they exit. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I have um, met animals who, who are absolutely waiting. I mean, this week, I think we ta I talked to somebody who said, your, your dog needs to know you're going to be okay. You're going to survive when when they pass and um because the lady wasn't quite sure <laughs> you know uh and and i said you, you need to look through and see if you've got the strength and if you do we, we need to, to let her let her know mm -hmm. uh because because again they do care about us they're they're um how do we, that that that's for many it, it is a thought it's part of the thought process of uh, going and hmm. and then some of the animals who go through accidents and things like that I think that might be a that might be applicable mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about it but that might be applicable for those folks too it's a traumatic way to lose somebody mm -hmm. but what you're saying did do you think that could be true for well, animals there's, well? you know I, I think that any Anything that is typically um, uh, traumatic towards the end, uh, you know, will quite often lead to some lingering issues um, that are want to be resolved. And there's been I've uh, most often encountered this in those that are uh, that were comatose at the time that I communicate because of whatever reason, be it a stroke or they had uh, some type of accident or something like that that happened. Um, that's where, you know, you kind of walk in and figure out, 
you know, is there something that the family wants to know, or is there something that's unexplained? Um, is there something that, because, you know, once again, if that person does not make it for whatever reason, you know, there's, the family would want to know certain things, certain details, was there more that I wanted, you know, so this is where I try to get those things figured out, and I will see that quite often in those that, you know, have had something tr physically happen traumatically that they can't, um, that caught even them off guard. And, you know, I, I would imagine certainly too with animals and others, if they happen to, you know, been, uh, brushed by a car or something like this, there's, there's going to be things of like, oh, wait, hold on. And, then, get here? <laughs> yeah, and that's where, you know, we, you, we work to figure that out. And there are, you know, we, there are those people like animals that they will claw their way back from anything because that's part of their personality. They are just going to do everything they can to get back and do it for whatever it is. And then there are some people that think, well, okay, uh, they don't try as hard. Um, it, oh, once again, that's where I believe that kind of personality issue steps in for many of them. And, I, you know, obviously your dog said, hey, don't give up on me yet. No. And I think that's exactly that's that's that personality. I, I, I you know, because I think a lot of times when I encounter somebody who's at the end and I can't figure out what's going on, you know, my, my question, the way that I phrase it to them is, you know, I don't say, God, why are you still here? Or something like <laughs> that. Um, I typically go in, I say, you know, what are you holding on to? Is there something that you're holding on to that you, you want to know or find out or do? And that phrasing of the, what are you holding on to? Um, which is taught to me by a friend of mine who does similar work, um, really works. And it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm holding on to this, that, and then we look to clear that out and go. And I said, that was another that, um, you know, trauma can do it, um, lead to unresolved stuff. Um, but, you know, it's all, you know, once again, I, I, the, the biggest lesson I'd learned recently was the personality is just as big of a piece of the puzzle as getting rid of some of the lingering issues at the end, allowing them to exit because they lived with the same dignity that you, you put up with their stubborn behavior while they were alive. It was frustrating, but you put up with it. Okay, that's probably the way they're gonna work out this exit too. Oh, oh that's that's great. Uh, I actually wrote down, what are you holding on to? I think mm -hmm. that is a great question to ask. Um, so what about a per person's religious beliefs? How do those affect <laughs> the final days? Well, that, you know, that's tough. A lot of people kind of, um, I have never been afraid to ask any questions. I will make every type of joke known to God and man. I love all these types of stuff. I have always been rather irreverent in the way that I lived anyway. And it was the fact that I, I realized that, you know, uh, there is a particular energy that you encounter when somebody is really desperately fearful. You kind of get in there and there's just a buzz to it. And I'm sure you know what that is. It's just a buzz. And when you sometimes investigate it, you'll discover that, you know, it could be some of those regrets are making them wonder where they're going to end up. Um, if they had incredibly um, um, very strong Catholic upbringings at time, that can put a lot of, you know, there's some judgment in what you're going to do and where you're going to end up and this type of stuff. A lot of religions, a lot of very fundamentalist people also will have um, beliefs that, you know, there is, there's an exit and it's either up or down in the elevator. There's no other choice. And a lot of people think that, well, I did this 20 years ago. I really didn't think about it that much, but wow, I'm at the end. That might've meant a lot. And my elevator's going down. I'm afraid. And this is where, you know, that's, it really plays, um, it plays into their ability to kind of let go and enter that labor of leaving because, you know, no matter what the issue is that they think they may have done or did or didn't do or whatever it was that they're holding on to this guilt or whatever it may be, it is affecting their ability to, to kind of see past, to see the light because they don't see the light. They just see, um, you know, uh, damnation, punishment, something like that. So this is where it's a large part sometimes of what I will ask some of the questions I ask the family going in is, 
you know, were there particular religious beliefs, were there things that were here? And then as I kind of step in, I will kind of make that inquiry that, you know, I will, um, and I'm sure you've heard the stories and I'm sure you would spray with your animals, you know, it kind of at the end of the, the bed, quote unquote, when people are close, there's always that, there's that light, always at the end. And there's usually a good three, four people that I can discern that are waiting. They're, they have their arms outstretched, just waiting for the person to take the hand. Um, and a lot of times when they're caught up in the fear of what's going to happen, they're not looking that way. They're looking down. So I try to encourage people, you know, I understand that you may feel this, that, or the other, but I promise you there, there's, you know, there's no retribution. There's no damnation. There's none of this. From my experience, it is light. You'll have the chance to review whatever it is you think you worried about, maybe have a better chance or do it differently the next time, but there's no condemnation. There's none of this. You're just going to go to the light, be able to see something and view it from a different perspective and say, geez, maybe I could have done that differently. I'll do that differently next time, maybe but you're going to the light. There's nothing but light and love when you cross. That's all that exists. And I've even gotten to the point on a couple of occasions um, where some people, they were really, and I said, in my communication, I promise you, I haven't seen a flame once. <laughs> I promise you, I have never seen a flame. I have just and only seen a beautiful welcoming light and there's your mom and there's your brother and there's the other stuff. And you kind of do it that way. And that's where when we try to work, but that can uh, religiosity, particularly very polarized religiosity of heaven and hell type thinking, um, you know, typically that person will also have been very polarized in life. Everything was black and white. There was no gray area for these people in a lot of cases. And that can make these final days difficult for them also. But that's where we kind of step in and say, you know what, hey, there's, I promise you, there's something different here. And I try to, sometimes it will take more than one talk to them, but it works out, but it, it can. And that's why I hope that people and people listening to this and others will realize that, you know, just maybe consider that there might be another option. Okay, you know, thank you for it, that. It's, yeah. it's, not, uh, it's not just one or the other and uh, help people do that because then it won't, it won't tie you up. It won't confuse you at the end. That's so lovely. I, I am, and before I was focusing on animals, I had a lot of. Uh, I, I might after talking about it, it may happen again, but a lot of encounters with um, folks who chose not to go either place. I guess uh, the general terminology are like ghosts, mm -hmm. uh, because they're like, I ain't going, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, but more specifically, uh, a friend of mine asked me to talk to her mom because uh, when I connected with her mom, she was, she ain't going anywhere. And the, the woman had uh, issues with uh, um, addiction, probably alcohol and prescription drugs. And um, as a recovered person, I could see, you know, that's something that all, all of us in recovery see how that path, that path could take you. And I did have to have exactly that conversation about there being light and there being safe love. And uh, she needed to just reach out and find it. And yeah, she's probably going to have to take a look from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the goal. And that's not the place she's going to end up at. She needs to just look. And I, it's funny that you say take the hands because I always saw like reaching up to, uh, to the brightest light uh, that you can, you you can feel, and I said, just grab them and follow them up, and that was my version of it. And I, I felt that she moved on, and um, it was a relief for me and my friend because you, I. That's I think people do, after they pass, if they haven't uh, let go of that black and white thinking, they they might still be stuck. Well, and I think that's part of it because when the body, you regardless of what their decision is, decides to let to just say you know enough, um, that certainly that can happen. Um, and I think that um, you know a part of this, uh, um, you know, I uh, when I approach that fear, sometimes in people, uh, you know, there's a 
you know, we all have that innate fear of falling. We're born with it, right? So yes. when, um, when somebody's at the end of life, they sometimes will exhibit this, you know, almost a fear of falling. And I will, you know, I'll tell them, you know what, when you're ready to go, um, you know, what you can do is, you know, it may be confusing, it may be a little scary, but when you're really ready to go, I think of it, and I've used a couple of analogies where if, if it's a woman, I say, you know what, when you're ready to go, it's kind of like shaking off that pair of pantyhose. You know, you feel like your feet are kind of stuck in the air and you, you're just, you can't quite get them off, but you, you want to go and you want it off. And I said, it's, it's, that's all it takes when you're ready to let go and you're just about there. It's, it's just that little movement that you need to kind of shake that pantyhose off. Or, you know, for a guy, I say, you know, that, that pair of pants, those work overalls, you know, you just, you got to just get them off and then you're going to go straight to where you want to be. And um, that helps sometimes that, because I think sometimes that final release can be a little scary. So I apply that analogy to say, that's all it is. This is all that's going to happen. Then you're going straight to your loved ones right there. And then also there's times when you know, be it addiction or anything like that. I know when my father-in-law, he's, you know, we've had a few conversations with him. He's an engineer and was in life. Um, and, you know, I tell him that when you're, when you're ready, imagine all of the neat stuff that you did and designed and, and, and uh, uh, created and all of that. Can you only imagine how much you're going to know when you get over there? Can you have any comprehension of the, you'll know how everything works. You will have the ability to engineer anything you want. Imagine the joy that you'll have when you can get over there and do all of these neat things, have all of this stuff. Because we realized my father-in-law was one of the birds knocking on our kitchen window. Not, not one of the birds, but was coercing or leading one of the birds to knock on our window. Um, right. And when he'd show up and we, we'd go, I was like, oh, Bob, that is really cool that you're, you're making that bird do that. That is so cool. And that's when we'd say, well, can you make it a different type of bird, another color bird tomorrow? And we do that. And damn, it wasn't a red bird the next day. You know, it's that stuff where we're making these things. And as when people are fearful, and I'm sure you can find analogies for pets or for that, you know, can you imagine the number of tennis balls you'll have when you get across? Or you know what I mean? Something of this nature that you that helps them look towards the light. That's all we're trying to do. And uh, that's where I say I point it out and they're going to go when they're ready. He's going to continue to work this. But that's all part of that process that I will, if I'm encountering fear, I'm saying, you know what? Just got to shake it off. And then can you imagine what you can do, the stuff you can build, whatever it may be, but apply it to that person. So, and I think it would have to be the same way with pets that are maybe a little scared or worried, you know? Yeah, I think, um, I, I get what you're saying. I have a slightly different, uh, maybe visual of it, but mm -hmm. it, it's very similar. I, I, I ask them to step out of their body when they're ready. Like they step out of the house or step out, or, you know, get out of the car. And we we have fun with the the people, the guardians, because um, uh, uh, I ask who's going to be there. I you know I get a sense, uh, probably not as strongly as as you do, Peter, but uh, we we decide that there will be a party and that the you know to look around and say there they are. Mm -hmm. They're going to show you, it's going to be like, come on, pal, let me show you the best places to go and have fun. Yep. And then, and I, I, um, cause we're already over here. We know the ropes. We yep. are going to, we're going to have you in here. And, um, the other, let's see, the other thing was, um, many animals are, are unable to do those things that they loved and, and that's all the other things that, that I remind them is you, you know you're going to be able to run again you're going to be able to yeah. do all that stuff and, and you're going to feel so good you 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 are going to know that you had a good decision so um I I have a different slightly different flavor but well, I, I think, think it's the same, same thing, I right? think, still think it's the same thing because when yeah they you know, you're caught up, you're caught up in this unfortunate you, dementia, whatever it is now, but um, I've communicated, you know, you, you will never have to miss another kid's, grandkid's softball game. 
You'll never miss another this. You will be able to participate in life with your family more than you have ever in the past. And that's part of what bringing that stuff forward is. And I think that's the exact same thing. You're telling the animal the same thing, yeah. Look at what you will be able to do. And I think it, it, it is so incredibly healing because when you're able, when they finally kind of get to the point of that, when the understanding lands and they get it, it's like their heart chakra explodes. It yes. just goes. And then you realize, okay, it's landed. And then they're going to take their time or do what they need to do. But now that the heart chakra is open, that's going to buoy them up to find that light when they're ready. Um, and that's what I like. It's the same thing. You're, it, we're talking about the same exact thing there. Helping them, just pointing them to the light is what we're doing. I, I love it. Uh, and uh, yeah, we talk about afterwards that um, they won't be disconnected from their family at all. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I had I had a conversation with somebody and uh, her daughter and the, about a dog that passed that the daughter loved dearly. It was probably nine or ten, and she asked, "Does she miss me?" And the response from the dog was, "No." And I'm like, "I can't tell this little kid." And I said, "Give me a little more information." He says, "I don't miss her. I can see her anytime I want. I'm around." Mm -hmm. I said, "Oh." It's yep. the people who can't, you know, yep. it's a one-way viewing now. Um, and and then um, gave gave permission to you to, as you said, with the birds of showing up uh, in different ways in dreams or, you know, that picture at the side of their, you know, like, did I just see a little dog tail go by? Or were those yeah. the clicks? Was that a meow? Um, so uh, so that they know, and also the people knew that there's still that connection. It, it doesn't dissolve upon physical death. Well, I can tell you that Dewey is still around the dog bowl this many years later. And Val still very lovingly steps aside. We can see it all the time. And uh, when Dewey shows up and uh, the, the puppy isn't as gracious about it, <laughs> um, but uh, Val will still knowingly step aside and we'll watch him and then he goes back. Um, so it's, you know, they're there. They continue to be there. Yeah, they, they enjoy it. I, you, you can tell when they're outside um, with the dogs playing. It's, you know, they're still participating. It's yeah. so, good. Mm -hmm. so good. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put your contact information in the notes, uh, okay. but can you... But before I ask for that, is there anything else? I think we hit a lot of this, uh, but is there anything else that comes to mind? Sometimes there's something think, that just feels like it should be shared, but- uh, I think we've probably covered it. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think we've, uh, I think we answered a pretty good amount of questions. I'm certainly open to anything else that might pop up um, that people may uh, wish to email me about. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think on, it's incredibly similar um, in a lot of ways. And it's, it's uh, particularly with the pets. Um, and I love your kind of thing about there being one communicator in every house. Um, and, you know, I think that's what is so um, incredibly useful bringing it forward because that is, you know, they not only, we're not only sometimes trying to figure out, well, why is Fluffy crapping in the hallway, you know, that, okay, that's fine. We can figure that out. That's interesting. But they have so much more to tell us. And I think that's what I think is so neat about the animal communication. Part of it is that you can, uh, you know, the stuff in particular you brought through for my pets when they just, they have a lot of opinions and a lot of stuff. And because as we've said, when, you know, the animals kind of marinate in the energy of the home they're in. And, um, you know, when when we're growing and expanding and spiritually aware and all these other stuff, our kids, our animals, everything rises up with us. And yes. um, they begin to show, and I think they have some, you know, interesting questions also yes. um, with it. And that's what I think is so fascinating about the, the that type of work. Um, and I so said, they, they know a lot. And there's, you know, as I said, I had the story about the kid whose service dog told me exactly what was going on. Um, and, you know, that was one of the things where I, I had no idea that this dog would have 
I really underestimated the dog having any comprehension of the problem. But this service dog was, you know, kind of like Hermione Granger in the Harry Potter movies. I know, I know, I know, I know this type of stuff going on. That's what the dog was doing. He understood. And I got the information that helped that kid that he works with completely from the dog, which I rarely do. I don't really, I don't communicate with the pets walking in. I just don't do that. That's not my specialty. Um, and I think, but that dog was more than willing to say, I know what will help this child. Please let me tell you. And that's what was so important. And I think that's why this is so, I love that kind of thing that you're trying to do of get it because you never know how they're gonna be able to help us. And they know and understand far more than we could ever comprehend. Um, and, and you're right, there's no such thing as a stupid dog. They are there and participating consciously and actively and spiritually in our homes when we allow them. Um, and that's what I, I love because they, they bring a whole other dimension to everything in our lives. And I think that's why I, I love what you're doing with that kind of training to in that focus. Thank you, thank you so much. It, uh, wow, I, 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 yeah, I guess I'm speechless. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so quickly, maybe your website and your email address. Uh, those are probably the two best ways to to contact you if people want to. Could you share yes, those? The, um, the the website is um, you'll see it at the top of my thing there. It's mindproxy.com. Um, and then uh, all the contact uh, information, when you scroll down to the end of the web page down there, you'll see the contact and there's a contact form for a way to email me and do some other stuff. And you can see that right on the website. It's all there. Um, finally got the, after a lot of time, finally got the website up. Um, but that's all there. I welcome any questions um, that come up. I know these topics sometimes have some lingering questions in the future, yeah. so I'm more than willing to answer anything. But, you know. And and you work, because of the work you do, it's telepathic and you're just like me. You're not uh, confined by, you got to be in Virginia Beach, right? No. <laughs> Location doesn't matter, right? Let's just no, we it. can, uh, remote work, as we all know, is part of the Marfa field we can do no matter uh, where we are. Um, I do have a tendency to usually want to get in the room with people. That's ah. just kind of who I am. Um, and I, I prefer, because I just... Typically, I can get the family and everybody together at one time. Um, it's not necessary, but that's kind of me. When I can, okay. I like to do that. Enough. But um, there's, uh, you know, the work can be done. Uh, I mean, I've worked for all over the world with people. Uh, usually, if I can get a name um, and uh, call me up and I seek out permission, and then I can usually go right off the name. Okay. Um, that's the case. Thank you. Uh well, I hope everybody enjoyed this as much as I did. And Peter, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. And um, I'll say best wishes. And um, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, all righty.